Coming up on this week's episode of the Ask Women podcast, we have Amy Chan on our show. And Kristen is not on the show this week, which is great because Amy got to talk and share a lot of wonderful information that you are going to absolutely love, which is talking about lust, love, and desire. What is the difference and how and if you can create those things if they're not there in the first place. We talk about people's attachment styles and how that leads us to select and choose partners that may not be great for us and how to potentially reverse that programming so that you can choose better in the future. We also talk about a chemistry compass. I mean, a million things that we cover, but overall, the biggest and best thing that we discussed on this episode was how to get out of the friend zone if you're in it. So keep listening. All right, welcome to the Ask Women podcast. It is me, Marnie, owner of The Wing Girl Method, author of the best-selling Get Insider, which is available on Amazon, the host of Ask Women podcast, a ton, a ton of things, guys. I'm so weird with doing the intro because Christian always does the intro and she is not here today. But I have the wonderful Amy Chan on with me who reached out to me probably like five months ago, basically saying she has a ton of stuff that she wants to share with men, the audience for the Ask Win podcast. And I loved everything that she had to say. So I was like, oh my God, come on, please, 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 please. So Amy, welcome to the Ask Win podcast. Thanks for coming on. Yay, thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, you are are wonderful. I know that. But why don't you tell the people who are listening a little bit about you and why you know what you're talking about and what you're going to talk yeah. about today? Sure. So I'm Amy Chan. I am the founder of Renew Breakup Bootcamp. We take a scientific and spiritual approach to healing and rewiring the heart. And I've been a relationship columnist for the last 10 years, studying the psychology between lust, love, and desire. And I have a book coming out called Breakup Boot Camp, The Science to Rewiring Your Heart coming out next May. That's amazing. So tell, I, I, I don't even know where to start. Well, I know that before we started the show, I had said the main thing that I wanted to focus on today was teaching people about attachment theory. And you had a little twist on that. So I'm going to let you take the lead because I think you've been doing this research for so long that you have a better understanding of this. So I, I would like to first actually learn the difference between love lust, and I forgot what the third one was that you said. And desire. And desire. And then like, let's figure out how that's tied to people's attachment styles. Totally. So I think what I'll do is I'm going to share with you, why do we choose the people that we do? Why do we feel and react the way we do in relationships? And the way I'll explain this to you is going to be in three parts. The first part is attachment theory. The second part is our chemistry compass. And the third thing that ties it all in is understanding the chemical reactions that cause love, lust, desire, and commitment. I love it. And I'm going to first start by explaining what is attachment theory. So for those of you who have never heard of it, basically by the age of around two to three years old, we develop an attachment system, which pretty much determines how we will relate romantically as adults. Isn't that crazy? Basically. It's crazy and it's all subconscious. Yeah. And so understanding this, our own attachment style and the attachment systems of our partners will really help us have healthier relationship outcomes. Now, there's three different attachment styles and I'll go over each. The first one, which affects about 50% of the population, is a secure attachment. This means you're not afraid of intimacy. You're also not codependent. Basically, you grew up with parents who are able to sense your needs without over-controlling you, without abandoning you or rejecting you. And so you pretty much have a very secure and trusting relationship with your primary caregiver, which later on in life will extend to your romantic partner. And so people who have a secure attachment style have the highest rate of success and happiness in long-term committed relationships. They're uh, less likely to cheat in the face of a fight or an argument. They are able to communicate and work through it without thinking it's a huge catastrophe. And so this is the gold standard. This is where we want to be. 
Now, the next kind of attachment style is an avoidant attachment style. So people who have an avoidant attachment style actually subconsciously suppress their attachment system the minute someone gets too close. And so these are people who generally have parents who are either over-controlling, this is called enmeshment, and so they might have had to take the place of a caregiver. So maybe one of the parents was an alcoholic or wasn't around, and so suddenly that child grew up having to be the father or the mother or the therapist something totally inappropriate for a child to be other than being a child. This could have been the product of a child who basically had parents who would live vicariously through their child and base their child's achievements Mm. using their validation to, you know, solidify their own validation. So what basically ends up happening is this child grows up having a dysfunctional relationship with intimacy. And so when someone gets too close, they will actually sabotage without knowing that they're doing this. And they will do what's called deactivating strategies. So for example, you might have gone away uh, on a romantic weekend with this new person that you're dating. And then suddenly you get back and instead of continuing that connection and flow, you suddenly go into a cave or you suddenly feel suffocated or you're like, oh my God, she's so needy. I just need to get away Mm. from her. So you might think, oh, it's because the relationship is no longer good or there's all these issues with this person. But really, that's your deactivation strategy that's super subconscious and it's your way of squelching intimacy. Mm -hmm. Now, men are more predisposed to have an avoidant attachment style than the next kind, which is an anxious attachment style. And someone with an anxious attachment style comes from inconsistent caregiving. So this means sometimes their needs were met, sometimes they weren't. What happens, it trains this child to grow up. (laughs) Yeah, that's a lot of women, unfortunately. And it trains the child to grow up thinking, I might not get my needs met, this is death. Because back (laughs) when you were a baby, not getting your needs met meant death. And so what happens is you have a very hyperactive attachment system. And if you're triggered, meaning you don't hear back via a text message that you send, or the person that you like doesn't initiate making plans, or they take a little too long to call you back, suddenly your nervous system and your attachment system goes completely out of whack. And you actually cannot calm down until you reestablish connection that your bond is safe. And what will happen is you will actually do what's called protest behavior. So this might entail the person that you like took four hours to text you back. You might go, oh, screw you. I'm going to take four days. Mm -hmm. See how you like it. You might really like someone. And instead of really seeing how this bond goes, your immediate reaction is, oh my God, I might get rejected. I might, I must date or have sex with two other people just so that I don't like this person too much. These are all sabotaging behaviors because you inherently fear being abandoned or rejection, rejected at any time. In the face of a conflict, instead of seeing it like a secure person where, oh, we're having an argument, we're going to get through this, you suddenly take it and blow it out of proportion and think, oh my God, it's over, it's over, it's over. You might even try to abandon or reject the person that you like because you want to preemptively do it before they do it to you. And here's the kicker. Anxious are drawn to avoidant. Avoidant Mm -hmm. are drawn to anxious. Why? Because we all want to screw ourselves in love. That's interesting. Yeah. So avoidance and avoidance actually lack any glue for it to actually stick together. Because the one avoidance like screw you and the other avoidance like screw you. And so it doesn't go. And anxious and an anxious becomes so explosive that it usually just can't even come together. Right. And so what happens is an avoidant has a storyline that, oh my gosh, uh, Anytime I'm with someone, they, they really take away my freedom and my autonomy. And so they actually attract situations where they draw in and are drawn to an anxious because it actually confirms the belief system that they have. Same thing right. goes for an anxious. They have an inherent fear that they will be abandoned or rejected and they create situations and are drawn to people that can confirm that this belief system is actually true. 
That's just crazy. Well, that makes sense. That makes complete sense. Well, so I have a million questions, but so I'm trying to, to give the best information for the guys that are listening. So number one, if you do realize that you are either anxious or avoidant, or even if you're secure, is there a way to, first of all, become aware of it, obviously, by you know, doing a little bit of research, asking yourself some questions, which I'm, I know that in the book, I think it's called Attached, which is the main book on attachment theory, will give you those answers to know which category you fall into. But is there a way to alter this about you? Or is it really just being knowledgeable about the fact that this is happening so that it's bringing it up to your conscious level that can help to tweak, fix, alter this behavior? Yeah, great question. So about 20 to 30% of the population is able to change their attachment style through their lifetime. But what it does take is awareness and a commitment and discipline to actually move through it to become more secure. And so the very first step, like you just said, is awareness. And so as I'm talking, there might be one that you identify more with, and that's probably the one. So an avoidant, your inherent fear is that your freedom and your autonomy is going to be taken away from you. And you generally feel that partners are too needy, or they're suffocating you, or they're always pressing you for commitment. If you have an anxious attachment style, your inherent fear is you're going to be abandoned or rejected at any time. If you could, you would merge and fuse with your partner. (laughs) And so uh, the very first step is awareness. And there's so many resources and quizzes out there. Even if you go to my website, you can find a quiz on attachment style. Find out what your attachment style is. And then the next step is very helpful. If you're in a relationship, find out the attachment style of your partner. Or if you're about to get into a relationship, look for people who are more secure. Because if you keep dating someone of the opposite of attachment style, it's going to keep rewounding you over and over again. Well, unless, now, unless you're yeah, aware. Because yeah. I, I feel like there's a smaller portion of the population that is in this secure category. So like, how, how do you... How do you find these things out? So let's say you're on a first date. Are there certain questions that you could ask that don't seem, you know, too probing, but that could give you a little bit of insight? Because yes, it would be wonderful if you could find somebody that was secure, for sure, because then they're going to make you feel great. But Uh most likely, or I don't know what the percentage is of people, of the breakdown for people, um, but they may interact with people who have other attachment styles. And I want to get into that about like, how to spot this attachment style, but then also how to call attention to it when uh-huh. they act out for their for their attachment style so that it actually brings you closer together. And I know I'm jumping ahead with a million things, but I want to talk about the first question. So how, like on a yeah. date, how can you figure out what attachment totally. style So the greatest way to see how someone is going to behave in the future is to look at the patterns of the past. And so if you just ask questions on on past relationships, they'll start to give you data. So if they say common things like, oh, we broke up because she was just so needy or they wanted more and I couldn't give it to them, you could start to see were they moving away from intimacy or were they always chasing for more intimacy? And that could right away tell you. So... I think that's a good way to assess. And the other way is you actually just need time to see how they behave. And so if you have a romantic time with someone and they pull away afterwards and you don't hear from them and they're completely inconsistent with their affection, that's likely a sign that you're dealing with someone with an avoidant attachment style. If you go on a date with someone and through, through time, you find that they're constantly messaging you and almost very high strung and maybe even making demands on like, oh, why aren't you texting me back or even passive aggressive? Then you might identify, oh, they have an anxious attachment style. And this doesn't mean like, oh, you date, you dump them right away because you're where you are with your attachment system. It's on a spectrum. And depending on who right. you're with will bring out certain sides of you more than others. So if you're very severely in the anxious attachment style category and you date someone who's on the other end, who's super avoidant, I would say avoid this person. You're really going to just get harmed until you actually start to become more centered and more secure. 
But if you're more, you're secure with some anxious tendencies, is it possible to date someone who's also secure with some avoidant tendencies? A hundred percent. If there's open and honest communication and two people are committed in trying to work through this together, you can totally do that. Okay. So let's, let's say these people have been dating for two months and they go on a trip together and they have a really good time and they come back from this mini trip. Or let's even just say they've been dating for two months and then behaviors alter Mm -hmm. and the the girl isn't contacting as much. She's not res responsive. What would be something that this guy could say to, to let her know that he, he gets what may be going on just to rebuild some faith between the two of them? Yeah, good question. So that it could switch things around, yeah. Yeah. So the number one people thing people do when someone pulls away is they chase. This is the last thing you should do. When you chase someone who feels like they need space or feels pressure and you chase them, they will only be repelled by you. And so what you need to do is if you identify that someone may have avoidant tendencies, you want to give space to that person. And I think what matters is you have to yourself get yourself into a state of high vibe because you can say all you want, like, oh, totally understand where you're coming from. We can take space, but you have, you're filled with anxiety. You're in a scarcity mindset. That energy will come through and that person will feel it. And so I think the first thing you need to do is reframe with yourself that you're secure, that you're high value, that you don't need to chase, that the right fit will come along and that there's nothing you need to do. I think that's the number one thing. Get your energy in check and into high vibe. After that, I would communicate to the person and say, hey, you know, checking in, it seems like we've been a bit distant and maybe you need some space. Let me know what's the best way to support you. That's it. And don't come from a needy place, right? Because when when someone pulls away and we're chasing them, we're actually not giving. We're trying to take because we're activated and saying, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose this thing. What am I going to do to get right, it back? So me. Yeah, totally. And that person can feel it. And so if you get yourself in a high vibe place and you're coming from a place of abundance and love and genuine care for the other person, that will come across. Okay. I love that. It's basically just saying like, you do your thing. I'm okay over here. I'd like to continue, but I know something's going on. And if I can help in any way, let me know. Totally. And I'm I'm going to add one one other thing on building back the rapport because it is very natural especially in the very beginning of the relationship dance, that you start off hot and heavy. Both people are equal in how much they like each other. And then eventually what happens is it gets a bit skewed and then the power dynamic shifts and then there's like the pulling and the chasing and all of that. You have to expect that there's going to be a natural back and forth and a little bit of giving and a little bit of taking and there's going to be some tension and that is completely normal. And so what I would recommend is if you hit this part where someone is pulling away. What I suggest is after some time, the next time you spend time together, make it a total low pressure, light and easy time. And I would do something that gets you guys out of your head. So I wouldn't just have a coffee and talk about emotions and what happened. No, your only intention for the next time you spend time together is to just deepen the connection. That might mean you go for a walk, you do something like painting, get into flow state. All you want to do is keep it light and so that the person's last association with you is light, easy, and fun. And it ends on a point where it's a high note. Don't drag it out, even though you're like, oh my God, I can't wait. I'm seeing this person again. I want to last all night. Don't do that. End it when it's on a high note. And so that the other person is like, oh, wow, like this is how fun it was. And then it ends. And so that you leave them wanting more. So I think that's a really great way of just getting that rapport setting momentum back into place. So without bringing up anything about it shifting, it's really just getting back to that fun state that you guys have with each other. I don't think it's necessary to have the heavy conversation as the next thing you do especially when there's been a bit of a riff and there's been a bit like, oh, too much pressure. I think the next thing you should do is just focus on having fun and then 
If that conversation naturally comes up, sure, have it. But if not, save that conversation for the time after. Right. Because you want to get back to that light place. It's so funny because so my husband and I, a couple of weeks ago, we, we go to couples counseling, as everybody should. And so when things come up for us and we have difficulties, we bring a third party in to help us see what we're not seeing. And mm-hmm. so our last session that we had a few weeks ago was like really heated. And we both sort of ended the conversation with the therapist and we're just like, just not, we were just both triggered. We were both in a really bad place. And our therapist had said, like, don't talk about anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nothing about your relationship. Don't talk about anything after this conversation. And as soon as we got off our call with her, because we do it over Skype, (laughs) my husband looked at me and he said, so do you want to talk about this? And I was like, no! Like, usually I would have engaged. I would have said, yes, like, let's drag this out and deeper into the mud even more. But I said, I don't think we should. We have to listen to those instructions. Let's go for a walk. And we went Uh for a walk and we chose not to talk about any of that stuff. And really, it just lightened both of our moods. Like, it took Uh away that anger towards each other and just let both of us kind of calm down to get back to a normal state where we weren't in fight mode. And get, again, get back to a nicer place where we loved each other again. And then we actually committed to doing that until our next session with her, which was the following week. And we just both came back and we got onto Skype and our therapist was like, oh my God, you guys look so different with each other. And and I really think it was because we had not continued to have that conversation. I know that that's deeper into a relationship, but I think that what you're saying as well is if there's something heavy, like let's get it to a lighter place and then we can make a decision at that point because everybody's, yeah, everybody's heavily triggered. Okay. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back with Amy Chan. Before we take that break, I do want you to tell people which website to go to, to do that little quiz that you had mentioned to find out people's own styles. Yeah. If you go to my blog, which is justmytype.ca, you can actually download a whole attachment style quiz and kit with tips on how to actually become more secure in your attachment. Ooh, .ca, Canadian. Okay, (laughs) perfect. Go to justmytype.ca. Yeah, and do exactly what Amy just said. And we will be back in a minute. It's so exciting when you have a credit card because you can just buy whatever you want. You have bags around your wrists. And then six months later, you just have bags below your eyes because you're stressed out from all of a sudden getting hit with these massive credit card bills. Well, I have a solution for you. And that is to pay off your credit card balances and save money with a credit card consolidation loan from my friends at Lightstream. I know, I have friends, isn't that crazy? Even crazier is that the online application is so quick and so easy. It's almost like the girl you wanna go out with. So you can go apply right away, even from your phone. And you can even get your money as soon as the day that you apply. So just for our listeners, if you apply right now, you get a special interest rate discount. The only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash askwomen. That's L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash askwomen. Subject to credit approval, rate includes 0.5% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash askwomen for more information. All right, we are back with Amy Chan. That was a very good intro explanation to attachment styles. It's so funny because when you were talking about all the different styles, I'm like, I'm that one, I'm that one, I'm that one. And I think that that's also important to realize is that it is possible for all of us in different stages to have each of these types of attachment styles. And sometimes it is depending on who we are hanging out with. And sometimes it's it's a matter of how we feel in those moments. But But you're saying at the core, there is one that takes the lead. So getting to know what your style is, is really important for you and for people who you bring into your life. Totally. I I just want to make one point is there is one attachment style that we predominantly have, which is wired in us when we were children. Now, what happens, this is a tricky thing, is we adopt protective mechanisms, which might look like a different type of attachment. So I am what you call an earned secure, meaning I've done the work, the therapy, the reprogramming to become secure now, but I used to be anxious. And what would happen is when I was triggered before, I would be the one calling, texting like crazy until I realized, okay, like I look psycho. 
And then I went to the other side of the spectrum and I'm like, oh, you took four hours. I will punish you and I'm just going to avoid you. Or I might just date someone else and I'm going to dump you. And so on the outside, it might look like, oh, I'm an avoidant, but I was really an anxious masquerading as an avoidant. Because again, the deep down fear I had was abandonment and rejection. So I would do all these protective defense mechanisms to make sure that I wouldn't get abandoned. But really, I looked like an avoidant, but I was still an anxious. Interesting. I I do want to tell a quick story about my husband. Because I I don't actually know which category I fall into. Because anytime that I talk to somebody about attachment theory, as I said before, I'm like, I'm that one, I'm that one, I'm that one. Most likely, I'm anxious, secure anxious. But I remember Mm -hmm. when my husband and I started dating, we were very into each other. And then it was all very casual. He went away traveling for a month. So nothing seemed like it was too serious, but we were both equally into each other and wanting to hang out because he was, you know, leaving a couple of months later and he left for a month and he kept calling me from there. And I, I, that was a little overwhelming for me, but it was nice at the same time. And when he came back home, he hadn't been with anybody while he was away. But things had shifted for us. I remember this. And I still sort of had my eyes open a little bit. I wasn't 100% into him because I had seen that he was 100% into me and I I became a little bit avoidant. And then there was this one Mm. day we were in the car with each other and he looked at me and he said, I know what you're doing. I know that you're seeing other guys out there. I know that you're thinking that maybe they're a better option for you. And he's like, but I'm 10, I'm 10 years older than you. I've been through that roller coaster. I, I know I want you. I want to be with you for mm-hmm. right now. Maybe not forever, but for right now, I like you. And I want to continue this. And as soon as he said that, it snapped me around and I was like obsessed with him. And then I, I went back to my anxious style. But it, mm-hmm. it, it was interesting that just saying, mm-hmm. making that statement of like, I know what you're doing and calling me out in that way. It was a very gentle way of doing it. I mean, maybe it fed more into my anxiousness so that, that I could lose somebody who felt that way about me. But it was interesting how it switched it over for me. And I had that happen in the past with another boyfriend when I was 18, where I kind of did the same behavior. And he, he said like, kind of the same thing, not in the same way. But it was just interesting how that simple statement turned someone like that, like me, who is more anxious, how that bold statement of where that person was at in a calm manner, had me more feel, feeling mm-hmm. more secure in what I had with this person. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to, to talk to you about the first thing that you had brought up, which was the difference between lust, love, and desire, and whether or not any of that matters. Yeah, totally. So basically, we have three mating drives in the brain. And they are not all connected. The first one is lust. This is driven by testosterone. And this is Mother Nature's way of making us have sex with as many people as we possibly can. (laughs) Now, the second mating drive in the brain is attraction, which is driven by dopamine. This is Mother Nature's way of having us now zone in on to one person to want to mate with this person. Dopamine is that super addictive chemical that makes us want to have more cocaine, chocolate cake, more sex, and text from your beloved. The more we get it, the pleasurable stimulus, the more we want it. And if our affections are not in return, we get into withdrawal. And then the third stage is attachment. And commitment. This is driven by oxytocin and vasopressin. And this is actually the bonding hormone. This is a chemical that is secreted when a mother gives birth, when she starts to breastfeed. And women actually secrete more of this than men after an orgasm. So, what happens is all these three mating drives intertwine to create love. Now, love can be sparked by any one of these mating drives. This is important to understand because what we're used to seeing in the media, in love stories, in fairy tales, is the story of lust turning into long-term love. But this is not necessarily the case. 
And the reason why this is important is you may be tossing out potential partners that could be really good for you in a long-term committed sense because you're not feeling that immediate lust right away. Because what can happen is you can actually be best friends with someone and then suddenly one day lust is sparked. You could also have great sex with someone and that can never lead to long-term commitment where attachment is sparked. So it's something really interesting to just keep note of. If you have a history of dating people where you're basing the long-term potential of someone, if there's crazy, crazy fireworks in the beginning, but every single time it doesn't last, this actually might mean you should readjust your expectations of how love is sparked and take a look at what is called your chemistry compass. So I would like to explain to you what chemistry compass is. Yeah. And it's something I talk about a lot in my book, Breakup Bootcamp, and where basically we develop a homeostasis of what love looks like and feels like to us. And generally, this is mirrored after what we experience as children. So if you grew up in a household where love was chaotic, and your parents were fighting all the time, or maybe you always had to earn love by doing, giving, achieving, what do you think is going to happen when you grow up? You create a homeostasis, what's familiar, a love compass based on that exact model. And so what you feel chemistry with as an adult might be people who trigger you and wound you in the exact same way you were wounded as a child. So I'll use myself as an example. I grew up in a household where there was always chaos and always fighting. My father was an avoidant, couldn't ever express emotions or show emotions. And at a very young age, I learned that I had to do really well in school and constantly achieve. I was always trying to earn his affection, his time, and hope that instead of being 10th on the totem pole of priority, maybe one day... If I only was perfect enough, I could be number one. Well, that never happened. And what happened as an adult is I would recreate these emotional experiences with different men. I would feel chemistry with people who could wound me just the same. So typically, they were men who were too busy, running businesses, never had time for me, would like me a little, but never enough. And to me, that was love. That was chemistry. And so I actually had to learn how to rewire my chemistry compass and learn how does healthy love and support feel like. And only until I did that, I was able to actually attract partners who were healthy for me. Interesting. Okay. I have so many questions from here. No, but that, okay. That's really interesting. I'm just trying to think like from the male point of view, from people who are listening, like how... Do you use this information? Is it that you stay away from certain people? Like, I I just think communication is the key and can actually be the thing. Insight and communication is what can alter each of these natural states or or styles that you're talking about. Like, so for me, mm-hmm. so I, if if I observe something in somebody, so if I was a guy and I was on a date and again, you get into talking about past relationships and if she, if the woman were to open up about some of these things that you've talked about, about like how she was in a past relationship, like even just having some insight into that, maybe that's my anxious style where I'm like, you get me and now I want to be with you. How can a guy use this information, again, not to, you know, take advantage of women and manipulate them, but to connect with a woman more instead of, you know, having her go off into crazy town. Like how, how can you calm a woman and then have this be used as some way to further connect to you? Do you, do you see what I'm asking? Like, I'm, I'm mm. not asking how to be a dick and like take advantage of this, but I'm asking like how, because these are good guys that listen to my podcast. They're not douchebags. You just want to find out like any mm-hmm. in that they have. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I want to give them the guidance on how, how to use this information. Yes, be aware of it. Don't be scared of it. But yeah, get, exactly. How to use this information to create a, a better style for two people if they actually do like each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the very first thing, even if you're a good guy or a good girl, is if you have a history 
of romances that aren't working out, there's that's likely an indication your chemistry compass needs a little bit of tinkering. And I think before we can even look at the environment, which is the people we're dating or try a different dating app, we need to look at ourselves because we recreate the emotional experience over and over again. And so the very first thing is take stock of what does love not feel like? List that down. It, love is not controlling. Love is not codependent. Love doesn't spark an anxiety spiral or your insecurities. You have to know what does love not feel like so that you can then determine what does love feel like. And then when you are in a potential relationship with someone and these things start to come up, have open, honest communication about that with the person. And I I think that's really like the very first step to rewiring is actually making sure that your health level is at a certain level of security and self-worth and coming from a loving and abundant place. And you will start to attract people who are of a similar consciousness. And of course, no one's perfect. Everyone's going to get triggered. And when you do, you have those conversations, just like you said before, not when you're in a triggered state, when you've age regressed to your hurt five-year-old, but when you are in an adult state and you're able to have a conversation to move through and move forward. I love that. I think that's amazing. Is there any way to, like you were talking about before, having a best friend and suddenly lust is triggered. How does that suddenly happen? How how can somebody who has been your best friend, who you have a great friendship with, how can they suddenly see you in that way? What is it that gets triggered to change that? Is it is it like hitting on your chemistry compass or like maybe doing something like your family did when you were younger or or what would it be? Yeah. So I mean, I, I wish there was this love potion, right? That the person that we're the most compatible with, our best friend, can suddenly become our partner. It can happen, but unfortunately, there's nothing you can do to control your chemistry, someone else's chemistry, and how they combine together. Some of it is just pheromones. Some of it is just the love map that you have. And so there's nothing that you can do to make someone have chemistry with you. I think using this information can help you so that you could be more open-minded that chemistry can grow. And so if you meet someone and you have fun with the person and the connection might not be so crazy, hot and heavy, like that other you know person that you had crazy fights with and crazy makeup sex with, but there's a connection there. Instead of tossing it out and saying, eh, boring, say, you know what? there's possibility that the spark can keep growing into a flame. So I'm just going to be open-minded to it. All I'm saying is give it some time, be open-minded, and that might actually help you identify potential partners that are right in front of you that you might have been discounting all this time. Well, so for a lot of the guys that are listening, they're typically the ones that are discounted, right? So... And I'm not saying that uh, guys listening to this show don't have situations where they have women who are, you know, pouncing on them and they're like, ah, not interested. They should definitely pay attention to that advice. But what about in the reverse? I know you said that you can't control someone, you can't give them a love potion, but if there were a few tips on how to potentially trigger a different side or a different portion of that person, of that woman that you have this great bond with to go towards a more sexual route or towards a lusty route or to like what, mm-hmm. what could a few things be to try to potentially get out of that friend space and have her see you as something more? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to say something on this podcast that I don't ever say nice. in public being recorded. or in my blogs. <laughs> so this is a top secret. Seriously. Okay. Chemistry is sparked by polarity. And we have a default energy state, which is masculine or feminine. Now, it doesn't mean that if you're a man, you have to be masculine, or you're a woman, you have to be feminine. You could be a man and be more in feminine energy and actually desire a more masculine energy woman. There's no problem with that. What's important is that you understand what is your default energy state. Masculine energy likes to take charge. It likes to lead. It's the one that's assertive. It likes to provide. It likes to take care. And and it's giving. Feminine energy is receiving, 
it's flowing, it is receptive. And so what's important, identify what your natural energy state is. Now, I'm going to assume that most of the user, the listeners on here are going to identify as being more masculine energy. Now, assume your role because it's super confusing, especially in today's landscape. I get it. But in a romantic partnership, especially in the beginning, you set precedent. So if you're going on a date and you're a little bit afraid and you're not taking charge and you ask the girl out by like, oh, like, yeah, uh, maybe we should uh, like get coffee or something sometime. Are you in your masculine or are you in your feminine? She's not going to have her panties wet. If she is a feminine energy woman who's going to, to have uh, her chemistry sparked by a masculine energy man, if you're in your feminine energy, mm-hmm. it's actually going to be completely neutralized mm-hmm. and she's going to put you in the friend zone. Now, if you are like, okay, I'm masculine energy, I want a feminine energy woman, then assume your role. That means take charge, take initiative, make the date, make the plans, pay for it. Take charge and be in your role and she will feel safe to relax into her role. This is how polarity is created. Polarity is needed for sexual tension. Don't repeat that. I don't want to get in trouble. I love it. I absolutely love that as a... (laughs) No, I will not. Fine, exactly. I will not. I will cut this out of the episode so nobody ever hears it except except for me and I can spread this secret on my own name. Uh, But that was a great place to end the episode. Amy, thank you so much for coming on to our show. Okay, so go to, what was the website again? Justmytype.ca. Yes, so that's my blog. That's where you can download the the attachment style quiz. And my other website is renewbreakupbootcamp.com that has all the information on rewiring your brain and what to do after a breakup. I absolutely love it. Anything with rewiring and reprogramming is absolutely wonderful. Oh my God, thank you so much. This is a great episode. I'm glad that Christian did not show up because she would just put in like little quips in between what you were saying and distract you. But I like that you were fully focused and able to give, you as, give us as much information as you did. So thank you for coming onto the show. Guys, go check out Amy's website, her attachment quiz. I actually already signed up for it, so I will be doing that as well so I can actually figure out what kind of attachment style I am and not go off of guessing anymore. New episodes of the Ask Women podcast come out every Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific. I email my list about it on Friday. So if you're not on my newsletter list, please go to winggirlmethod.com and sign up for my newsletter. And then you will hear about when new episodes are live. I also now post them on YouTube at youtube.com slash Marnie Kinris. There's a ton of episodes that are on there that you can watch, listen to, download, whatever you would like. If you want to send in questions for us to overanalyze on the show, which we don't get to as much lately, but we do still go through those questions, please send them in to ask at askwinpodcast.com and we will try our best to overanalyze and dissect what is going on for you. And if it's months after you sent it, then at least your answer or the answer that we give will be helpful to somebody else. You guys are awesome. We'll see you next week. 